This week on Around the Coin, Faisal Khan, Brian Romley, and Mike Townsend discuss everything about money transmitter licenses, including how they work, who needs one, and how Bitcoin plays a role. Around the Coin. All right, guys, welcome to uh, another exciting episode of Around the the Around the Coin podcast with Brian and Faisal and myself, Mike. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the concept and uh, arena of money transmitter licenses. Um, with that, uh, how is everyone doing today? Awesome. Doing good. Great, great. And as always, we have Brian to sort of break us down with the history of the subject. And Brian, uh, start us off. Thank you, Mike and Faisal. Uh, money transmitter What does it mean? I'm not even sure because it's been defining itself uh, since its history. Um, It wasn't called money transmitter at first. Uh, You know, it it really has its roots in the early money order system. But let's jump to where it really kind of got its uh, its, uh, traction. And late 1800s, uh, California gold rush. Uh, a lot of immigrants, a lot of people needing to send money all around the country, if not around the world. Um, there are a lot of companies that were more than willing to take their money and to move it around. Uh, what happened in that era was there were a lot of false uh, businesses that would take somebody's gold, convert it into a money order of a certain amount, and then that money order either would never arrive or it would be worthless. Some money orders in that era were actually certified checks. And that means a check of an exact amount uh, that could be cashed at any bank. That's nice. It feels a little better. But uh, it also um, could take, uh, back in that era, months to decipher whether or not uh, that money is going to clear and whether it was going to be reliable funds. The other type of money order from that era uh, was a... um, uh, a money order that can only be cashed at a certain facility. Wells Wells Fargo was known for this type of thing, and and uh, there were other companies that uh, actually dominated. And then when the telegraph kind of took off, um, Western Union uh, really uh, sort of controlled that market space. You know, the first money transmitter license was issued in California in 1936, you know, hmm. and it was – a long time before it was regulated. I mean, it, it, a lot of people are shocked it took that long. Uh, billions of dollars were lost um, because of um, you know, just bad practices. Even banks that were opening up locations in the in that region of the country, uh, you know, had had problems. You know, obviously moving money around. I think you can go all the way back to Knights Templar and people going to Holy Land as a way that the concept was there. So it's not a new. A new thing. I mean, it's this is back, uh, you know, uh, beginning of uh, you know our um, our era here. But now uh, the money transmitter laws. Uh, we have to understand that they were essentially built in California, built specifically to pr- protect consumers, and it wasn't really concerned about uh, necessarily protecting the businesses. They were very consumer friendly, proactive laws. Uh, and uh, it wasn't about money laundering and, and corruption or anything like that. Uh, and then we fast forward to the 1980s, again in California. Meanwhile, let's take a sidestep here. Meanwhile, other states started creating laws. Uh, a vast majority of them uh, took place in the 1950s and 1960s. They started at least vestiges of the money transmitter laws. And then we go into the 1980s, and this is really where it, went into turbo mode as far as regulation. 1980s saw a number of independent money order companies go bankrupt. And these are companies primarily in Texas and California, uh, but mostly in California along the border areas uh, where people were trying to move money uh, quickly. And they were un- unfortunately undocumented workers. So they were even paranoid to go into the post office, some of them. So they trusted the third parties. And uh, some really, again, were not real operators and others uh, had hordes of money and went bankrupt and nobody could find them. It uh, evaporated. So the 1980s laws were not very robust, obviously. And that's when California took the initiative around 1986 uh, to really start turning the laws up. Now, 
this obviously started to spread around the country, and the 80s are where we started to see a lot of this control. The benefit to the existing players, like uh, American Express and Western Union and the United States Post Office, who is, in fact, still the largest money transmitter in the world, uh, is, um, is such that they have actually have a competitive advantage. Like all regulations and legislations, uh, they tend to um, promote the entrenched player. So where we are today is the money transmitter laws were put into place primarily to protect consumers. They now have become more and more a tool to uh, eradicate potential competitors because of the cost and complexity for a, uh, a new business to try to get these licenses is, uh, is really un it's unfathomable for even very well-educated individuals to try to get through this labyrinth of, of, of laws as you move into different states. Now, 48 states directly re uh, regulate uh, money transmitters. The rest sort of uh, don't regulate it. It kind of falls indirectly to the banking rules uh, uh, within the state. And the licenses are issued by a vast majority of those 48 states. Uh, the variations of the licenses... Um, well, you know, there's capital requirements. You have to prove that you have a surety bond that's so large as to protect uh, the potential of, uh, of loss. But even the surety bond, I don't think, is as large as one should imagine with the amount of money that could be going into private hands temporarily. In this era, since um, the, um, the rise of um, perception of terrorism and money laundering in the United States, the um, the financial crimes uh, uh, unit of uh, the federal government and state governments are very concerned about money transmitters. How much money are they taking in? Who who uh, took that money in and where is it going? And uh, that's even created another layer of burden. So we have state regulation, which is not uniform throughout the United States. Some are easier to deal with and some are nearly impossible to deal with. Uh, then you have federal government regulation. Most of it started in the late 80s, but really took hold after the 9-11 uh, hmm. incident. And now the, uh, the, the, the federal government is requiring all money transmitters to unilaterally register with them and uh, the federal government and the state governments. So that's kind of where we are today. The federal government is pretty easy to, uh, to register with. You just uh, let them know uh, that you exist, uh, you pay a small fee, and you report. They want uh, uh, certain documents uh, under certain circumstances. And again, this has to do with um, uh, Know Your Customer, which is otherwise KYC, AM AML, anti-money laundering uh, rules, and... Um, basic banking uh, uh, requirements of monies that are in excess of certain amounts. Generally, it's $10,000, but that is not true necessarily for money transmitters uh, at this point. So that's, that's where we are today. Now, again, remember when we talk about this, that like all great ideas, it starts with uh, the, at least a kernel of trying to, to do something good trying to do something to protect individuals. And I think that's worthy. So, so, uh, so, Brian, did it start originally with people carrying money, you know, back in the 30s, 50s, 60s even, where people, you know, how, how was that? That's an interesting topic. Was it yeah. people literally delivering uh, currency to other people, you yes, know, workers, yes. and then, in, in, in and then states, they would just take, take, obviously take the physical currency? Yeah, in states um, uh, that were more widely separated you wouldn't see, um, you wouldn't see, well, let's just out the West when the, uh, as Texas, for example, when the oil uh, boom took place, a lot of cash was moving around. Um, people were paid in cash in the 30s and 40s. Yep. Uh, they needed to move their cash around. And again, companies like Wells Fargo and other bonded um, uh, uh, transports would would move money around for individuals. So these are these are like carts with horses and armed guards and well maybe not horses. <laughs> well, but <laughs> Texas is probably still horses. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean there would definitely there was definitely more armed guard type of scenarios. We can kind of go even back to the 20s and the early uh, oil, uh, really big oil boom in Texas. Um, there were a lot of independent banks in that era, uh, and they were not under what we would consider the FDIC today. Mm -hmm. And these banks would have runs and money would be put into the safe. And if uh, your classic uh, bank robber came in and took the money out of the safe, 
you lost your money. Right. And a lot of people forget that era. That's why there was such uh, paranoia about banks. Uh, you know, you put money in the safe, it's gone, your money's gone. That's it. Uh, and then you have to have to trust the bank actually was robbed. Uh, what, what took place, and a lot of people don't see this in the movies and the, and, and the glowing books of the era, is that some of these banks robbed themselves and they blamed it on, uh, you know, some Wild West character. And uh, uh, that is part of the problem. So the regulation of banks, you know, kind of dovetail with the regulation of money transmitting. You know, and, and let's face it, uh, the U.S. Post Office, when it jumped in in the mid-1880s uh, uh, into uh, becoming a money transmitter, essentially, uh, the first uh, U.S. Post Office um, money order what came at, from that era. It actually kind of started with Benjamin Franklin. He was printing money. Uh, he was probably the first Bitcoin miner, if you will. He <laughs> created the first paper abstraction money for microtransactions. A lot of people didn't understand that. The first paper bills were issued because the... Um, the money that was being used for coin at the time were too valuable. They were made of silver, and even then, they were equivalently worth more than like 3 or $4. So Franklin's being a, a printer and selling newspapers and microtransaction type of items like almanacs, uh, he created his own paper money, and uh, that paper money was being mailed around. He was also the very first postmaster. What was amazing to me is that concept didn't take hold. Uh, he said... If you're going to do a micro, what we would call today a micro nano transaction, it should go on penny. Uh, it should go on paper and not on coin, because even a penny costs too much money. Mm. So we can we can get we can attribute a lot of my theories today about micro and nano transactions comes directly from a lot of the early works of Benjamin Franklin. Growing up as a kid in in uh, that area, I, I used to go to the Franklin Institute and read some of his early works about money. It's it's funny how it's come in full circle. Wow. But here we are today. Uh, with uh, money orders still being uh, a predominantly large f uh, force at the post office. Um, I've had some experts within the postal system tell me that if they remove the money transmitter aspect of their business, by the way, the post office doesn't register as a money transmitter uh, in any state uh, for a lot of Interesting. reasons. Yeah. But if you were to take that out of the postal system, it would collapse immediately. It, it, is a, it is really a, a huge money center for them. And they are sometimes the lowest cost uh, uh, system out there. So uh, interesting if we were to break up the postal system, because some people had wanted to do that, uh, where that part of the system would go, because uh, it holds, it's a glue that holds it all together. So that's kind of where we are. And, 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 you know, the idea that people need to move money from point A to B uh, today seems to be very easily understood. We can do it electronically. We can do it in other mechanisms. mechanisms. But we have to understand that most of the mechanisms didn't exist 15 years ago. Uh, mm. and va a vast majority. E I would even argue 10 years ago, you couldn't do a whole lot of things with m the movement of money. Uh, e money orders. Uh, well, it wasn't. It wasn't until after nine eleven. See, when all the planes were were grounded, uh, what the U.S. government fully realized is the banking system got shut down, and somebody at the very top echelon in the Bush administration said, "Why is this happening?" Well, that's because about ninety five percent of all the checks in the United States were being moved in the bellies of aircraft, and when commercial flights uh, and private flights were were taken down. The checks couldn't move. So yeah. up to that point, there was nothing that was motivating people to move money it, electronically. It has been going down, system. though. I mean, uh, even just this uh, this graph I had been looking at says you have about $90 million of <clears throat> uh, money orders processed through the Federal Reserve or processed through the um, the postal system. And that has been declining for about 5, five to 10%. Uh, yeah, the, the, over the last uh, 10 years, it's actually been slowly declining as other alternatives take place. Mm -hmm. uh, also is declining because of the ID requirements. A lot of people not understanding this decline. The really big decline started when the post office limited the amounts that you could uh, send. At one time, you could walk into the post office, lay down twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, and they'd say, okay, thank you, and fill this out, and they would... There was nothing. Today, if you walked in with more than ten thousand dollars, 
they'd probably call the police. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. I'm totally serious. I've, I, I was actually at a post office where this happened not recently. It was quite a, a number of years ago. It was the first time I was really seeing this in front of me. And I said, what are you doing? And I said, well, under current rules, if I see anything suspicious, I have to call the police. And I said, what's suspicious? He goes, he came in with $10,000. So here we are in America today. Too much. If you have too much cash... You know, there's a question. So that's a, that's a that's tough, another, tough thing to deal with, Brian. I feel for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know, when, I'm, when I'm moving my, uh, my money to Mexico. No, but, you know, the, the real big challenge is why some of these things are going south is because the laws in the post-9-11 era have changed the relationship everybody has with money. And um, uh, after 9-11, uh, we went from, I think, 62% of people getting paid electronically their paycheck and uh, today it's uh, as high as uh, 85% uh, as far as major corporations it's 100% and nobody really gets a physical check anymore and they certainly don't get cash mm -hmm. in fact in some in some areas it's sort of illegal to give people their wage in cash so again money transmitting is changing because there's less and less people as far as the post office is concerned there's less and less people who have access to cash, and uh, the people who maybe were using it intently, uh, maybe they were not documented in the United States, and they just don't want to raise their profile. Mm. So they're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, it's interesting here in the 9-11. I mean, just had such a, a vast impact on every, how everything is done, but particularly yeah. moving money. Yeah, if um, I give you a check today, uh, your bank will not, it used to be your bank would move it physically to another bank or a clearinghouse. Today they scan it. It's uh, an extension of check 21, check 21st century uh, rules. And they scan it and the facsimile of that check is now legal to deposit. And now that makes sense, but there was nothing that was motivating that change until the government said you can't move checks in the belly of planes anymore. It's too dangerous. <laughs> so, hmm. Oh, yeah, interesting. Because it, it shut yeah. down the economy, and uh, a few uh, a few bundles of checks got burned up. You know, to be frank about it. Uh, so you know the uh, the whole thing. Uh, they didn't want the entire economy built on on something like that. It also obviously sounds very ra uh, wasteful. But you have to understand, like all uh, evolutions, they're not revolutions. You know, it it, it it's hard. It, it will be impossible to be a revolution in, uh, in finance and payments. It's unfortunate, but it's just the way we are. We're, all of us become very conservative when it's our money on the line. We, we can speak very glowingly and speculatively when it's not our money and, you know, yeah, I'll let it go this way, I'll let it go that way, why don't we do this? But as soon as your money is cut loose and it's not, uh, you know, uh, in a trusted environment, you kind of get kind of scared. And if, you, if your entire net worth is tied up in it, then you get really scared. Yeah, I mean, there, you'd have to think like even even FDIC insured <clears throat> banks have leverage and use that as a sales pitch, which you know is true. If you're looking back at the depression and saying, you know, now is a point where if a bank is not backed by the government, then I can't get my money out. Well, you have to imagine what does that day look like when I go to my bank and you walk into Fidelity or you walk into USA Chase and they say, sorry, we, we can't give you the money because we don't have it. Uh, that that that's a sad day, and you have to that's imagine that's already happening. Th that's well. So after after uh, the two thousand eight uh, failure, when banks were being shut down and and merged, there were people walked in could not get their money, and today yeah, but not nearly the case of of they're not in, the bank is not in risk of going no. under right they're no, not well, they're, they're not in risk of losing their money like they were in the Great Depression right no, and I think that's why FDIC backed it. Right. Yeah, of course. And but there's other there's other things. For example, again, if you go into a bank and you ask for a large amount of cash, uh, in parts of this world and in, in, in the United States, some banks will ask you, "Excuse me, what are you going to do with that money?" Uh, literally. And um, there's there's a shift in the relationship that people have with their money. Obviously, there's a shift in the relationship that uh, banks and financial institutions have with their customers. Uh, I don't. You know, it's made a lot of news, uh, but I've known about this for a while. There's certain uh, industry segments that banks are targeting uh, and removing all financial services to them. Mm. Uh, and uh, one of the industries most recently touching the hearts of a lot of people out there is uh, people in the adult entertainment industry. Uh, there is a bank, uh, Chase Bank, who uh, wrote letters to thousands of people 
who merely deposit their paycheck for a legal enterprise, and they're saying, we do not want your money in our bank. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you read that story, it's quite interesting because um, we're entering into a new era. Uh, I, I didn't ever think I'd come to the point where a legal enterprise, you know, whether you disagree or agree with its morality, uh, I understand in the credit card processing industry, we, we've had regulation against people who are in adult uh, entertainment for so, quite a long time. So, so let, let's air it out a little bit. What is so money transmitter license has a great history of it. You know, what is the value of it? What does when does a company, when does a startup have to start thinking about it um, as a consumer? Is it anything that you should be considering? You know, if if you use it one. One, one method of, of moving money with one company, um, you know, is that something realistically that consumers should be aware of? And then, you know, remittances, is there, how do, how do those sort of hold hands? Um, Faisal, what do you, what do you think? Sure. So, so first thing to understand is that the money transmitter license is issued to a business that is not in the banking domain. It specifically was issued originally to non-banking financial institutions and then was later extended on to you know, just non-banking institutions, period. So it is essentially required if you're a non-depository institution and you are moving money on behalf of someone and that is your revenue model, you require a money transmitter license. So it's very simple. If you're going to be moving money between two parties and you are doing so and you're charging a fee for it, you need to be licensed as a money transmitter. So that's one. Everywhere else in the world, and I can cite hundreds of examples for almost every country in the world, has a single money transmitter license. You get one license. It has categories, you know, as to how much you can do, what you can do, what you cannot do. You can do digital payments, you cannot do digital payments, etc. But essentially, one license is granted. In the U.S., you have essentially, so to speak, 51 licenses. 50 licenses, and then there's the FinCEN registration, which is the Financial Crime Enforcement Network. That's a very simple registration. But the 50 licenses uh, out of the 50 states that require it, 43 will actually issue you a license and the seven don't actually issue you a license, they just give you permission to do so. Of the 43, the minimum fees is, I think, $1,000. It goes as high as $50,000. Uh, you have to give a bond. The maximum bond that you can get is for $2 million. There's no bond higher than that. So, and, and here's very important. You have to know something. So when you get a bond for, let's say, one million, so one million bond essentially means that the permissible investment that you have, the permissible investment at any point in time, has to be one million because that's what it's insured for. So if you're processing one point five million at any point in time, you've exceeded your your, your bond and essentially you're over the limit and in, in in real terms in illegal capacity. But is it happening? Yes, it's happening a lot. Very large companies that have money transmitter licenses. PayPal, for example, I'm sure processes more than $2 million a day in California, but the bond limit is only $2 million. Hmm. So what does it take to get it? So that's the first thing. The first thing is obviously, like I said, an average of $10,000 a state, 47 states, or 43 states, you have to pay this money out to and you get the license. Then the bond. The minimum bond you can get uh, is $25,000. Then they'll, you know, it's up to the regulator. They'll say, okay, well, go get a $50,000 bond or $100,000 or $500,000 or $1 million or $2 million. It costs you about 5% a year to get the bond, provided your credit rating is good. You have to go to each state, register, give your business plan, show your audited statement, show everything, get fingerprinted, do a background check. So you physically have to go to each Department of Financial wow. Institutions or Department of Financial Services. That's incredible. And that, is, and that is assuming, that is assuming that the state is accepting applications. Case in point, a couple of weeks ago, New York opened its applications. They were closed before. So if you wanted to get a New York money transmitter licenses, well, guess what? You couldn't. Wow. So what does it cost these days? Ballpark average without the bonds, and, and I'm talking minimum bonds. So if, if you can get away with a $50,000 bond minimum, about 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars, including attorney fees. This does not take into account the bond fees. If you add the maximum permissible bonds, probably looking at about seven, eight million dollars, and that is what it will cost you every single year. Because you know, if you have to take two million dollars for 40 for 50 states, that's 50 million dollars. Uh, oh, sorry, 100 million dollars. And if you pay five percent of that, that's going to be. Five million dollars for the bond fee. Wow. 
it takes on an average, <clears throat> and here's the interesting part, it takes on an average anywhere from six months to a year to get a license. And the smaller states, Utah, uh, Vermont, etc., you know, they'll probably give you a license earlier on. But there are three states, well, five actually, that are of interest. The two big, the, the big three are obviously Texas, New York, and California. And then the two other ones are um, Illinois and Hawaii. Hawaii just for some reason thinks that they're, you know, they, 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 they really, really give you a tough time if you're going to have a money transfer license. But the big ones, New York, California, and Texas, are the hard ones to get. The license over there can be a very daunting experience. Being in front of the commissioners can be a very uh, insulting experience, even at many... F I mean, I've heard clients say that. Hmm. Uh, it can be a very uh, frustrating experience because of the fact that these money transmitters, uh, and I say this, and I say this without any hesitation, New York and California, for some reason, think they're the higher watermark society uh, for mankind as far as money transfer. Is <laughs> and, not just uh, that, though. <laughs> uh, not just that. And, and they put you through, a, you know, it's not like uh, the New York license or the California license is so revered in the world. It's something I need to operate. But because there is no federal license, every state has made it a prestigious thing. And New York and California you know, are the most prestigious licenses to get. Texas is neutral. Texas is hard, but it's neutral. They don't give you that much of an attitude. Whatever California does, New York tends to top it. Whatever New York will do, California will tend to top it. So you have a, a you know, sort of a beauty contest going on with, between the two states, and it becomes eventually very hard for businesses to get a money transfer license. And the one thing that is at fault here is because it takes so long uh, to get one, and you need to have your systems and your audits and your financials and everything in play, the time to market is grossly uh, misread. Uh, you think you could get away in one year or six months or eight months. Turns out, you know, that was, a, that was not very accurate. Wow. So you have to sometimes wait for 1.5 years, sometimes two years to get a license. And you may have missed your advantage in going to a market because you didn't have the license. Then you have companies that are um, VC backed and you know, they'll say, well, you know what? We'll go to market, pardon my French, screw the license, screw the commissioner, we'll just go. When we'll get big enough and when they come after us, we'll pay the fine and we'll get the license. Uh, this is what's happened to PayPal circa, I believe, uh, 2005, I'm not sure, 2003, 2004. Early, yeah, early 2000s. Yeah, and uh, so it, it, this is happening today. Uh, if you look at uh, all that's happening in, in the Bitcoin space, uh, many of the Bitcoin companies that I know of do not have a license yet. Uh, they don't even have an opinion on should the state even issue a Bitcoin license or not. So it works. And, I mean, well, it works. And, and, and here's the best part. So if you don't have a license, Guess what? The commissioners are not going after you. Hmm. Can you believe it? It's uh, oh, you know, we are we are we're drowning in paperwork, really. So you're drowning in paperwork. You're not going, but yet the person who's actually filed for the license with you is being is going through a hair pulling experience for months because you're not issuing one to them, and you're sitting on it and so forth. And like I said, California, and New York, they're the big bullies in this thing. Wow. So, so Faisal, who, you know, the, how many of these, uh, say just even in California and New York, how many licenses get issued say per year? And then who are these people generally that are walking up to the commissioner? Are they, are they all technology companies? Are they independent, you know, sales organizations trying to? Well, so first of all, um, f federally chartered banks don't require a license. So it's no, it's obviously not banks. State charter is state charter, hence they don't require a license. Um, and so the people who are coming to these are people who are, or rather businesses, that are somehow associated in the financial services industry. Uh, their association could be remittances, money transfers, domestic, international, uh, wallet providers, prepaid debit cards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So if you are classified under as such, you would definitely require a money transfer license. Hmm. And do you think most of them are specific to the state where they don't need to have a money transfer license in each state? A lot of the well, a lot of the guys going up there. Well, I mean, if you you know it, it, again, it, it depends on what sort of an attorney you have, and uh, so in most cases, they look at your business plan. Uh, you need to provide some information. They look at it and say, and and the state can come back and you know, and that is provided even if you write to a state uh, DFI or DFS. They'll come back to you after four months and say, guess what? You need a license or you don't need a license. You know, you ask for clarification and that can take a couple of months. Just just getting a, just getting an answer to a question. And if you do require one, then obviously you have to go through the entire process. So these companies are typically companies that would somehow be moving money on behalf of a client um, from point from, you know, person A to person B and be deducting a fee from it. And if they're doing it across state lines, then they need to be licensed in all the states. Wow. So when, when is Faisal's recommendation to, you know, how does a company intelligently decide uh, whether or not to get one? Do, you know, is there a, is there a expected growth rate or access to capital in a reasonable amount of time that you say, look, we're just going to not get the license, grow as quick as we can, and then raise money to pay the fees? How do you, how do you give advice to a company or a startup that's going through this process of thinking about well, what you're... I I get companies calling me day in and day out and saying, well, you know, first of all, they're not sh- too sure if they need a license or not. And since I'm not an attorney, quote unquote, I can't offer that advice. But I say, you know, looking at your plan, it seems you need one. So then they go check it from their attorney and they say, yeah, you know, absolutely, you know, we need a license. Then they say, well, you know, but I'm just a small guy. I, I, we're just two guys sitting in an apartment with an idea. How can we get a license? We don't have the money for it. So, you know, pretty much their dreams are doused and there's nothing much they can do. The other guys on the flip side who have the money, VC funding, they say, you know what, just go live. We'll go live, we'll get the license when the, when the state comes after us. So there's no one standing up for the small guy. Uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, there's a product called Face Cash. It's made by this guy called Aaron Greenspan. Um, and Aaron has a lawsuit out in the state of California, essentially based on the same, on the, pretty much on the same premise, although Aaron has a lot of lawsuits out. But he's suing you know, people like Facebook, Google, um, Apple, Coinbase, I don't, Square. Coinbase, <laughs> Square, etc. Ashton Kutcher. Uh, you know, uh, 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 the... the uh, Mark Anderson, you know, and everyone else on the same premise, you know, that how are you guys operating? And I think it's, 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 you know, one of those life is unfair kind of a thing that, you know, the state of California is not going after the big guys who are openly flouting uh, the requirement of having a license and not having one. Uh, And yet, you know, going and beating the crap out of the small guy who wants to get a license, but the state's making it so inherently expensive and a long drawn process for him or her that it's, you know, it, it literally is, you know, you want to take a, uh, a picket sign and go up there and say, life is unfair. What, what's this? What's going on? So you what know, do you, guys, a lot. is he going to win? Does well, he? You know, listen, I, I, I feel for Aaron, you know, it, he's sort of, if you've seen, um, you know, his history, he's, he, you know, work with Mark Zuckerberg and feels very strongly about his opinions about how he contributed to the uh, growth of Facebook. And, you know, probably uh, by all accounts, um, I've had limited interactions with him, an extremely intelligent individual, very logical, very engineering orientated, which certainly is the case for a lot of people in the startup community. They come into the political realm and they look at the lack of logic and they look at the the whole favoritism and the old boy network and these people are coming from the world of disruption and changing the world and when they hit the rubber on the road and see what the real world is like and it's uh, not a level playing field it is not even close and you know you become frustrated because those that have access to tremendous amount of political influence and finance uh, are going to bias the market and this is what happens in governmental systems uh, if unchecked rules will be designed as I said 
earlier here, rules will be designed to protect the people who already are in. And, um, you know, it's going to be a big debate for a long time whether or not the businesses he, I mean, he goes all the way down to the smallest type of, uh, you know, concept like Uber and uh, Airbnb, uh, all the way up to more obvious ones like Diwali and Square and et cetera. And, you know, it should be decided. Uh, I don't know if I agree with the tactics and the rhetoric being used and everything, but, you know, if you put your mind in the in the world of a of a creative genius uh, and trying to uh, innovate in payments, and then you go out there and you try to go and do this the right way, and the regulator says, "Oh, you can't do it," and you turn to the regulator and saying, "Hold it! All these guys are doing it." Sorry, I mean, what yeah. else? Either well, you well, run away. Or is it stemmed out of frustration? I wonder. No, but Mike and Brian, you must understand that there's a huge lobbying effort as well. That is, you know, part and parcel of all the VCs that are operating in California, for example. They are absolutely tied into the regulators. There is absolute unfair advantage that they do exercise over the small guy that has absolutely no networking with the commissioner or the commissioners, you know, for a particular state. So these guys are in there, and, and they know exactly what's happening. It's not like the state of California does know what Coinbase is doing, for example. You know, if I had to take a name of a company, they know it. Uh, and then if you ask, well, why aren't you going after it? Well, guess what? They have a backdoor arrangement saying, you know, you're not going to come after me until I'm so big. And if someone asks, say, listen, we're drowning in paperwork. We don't have the resources. That's a huge well, point. You know, and, and it also but, but comes it's down true. to... It's true. <laughs> But it yes. also comes, yeah, but it comes down to even the people that are regulating uh, in these offices. I've I've come to meet a few of them around the country. Um, they are overworked, they are understaffed, and they literally do not know how to interpret the rules when it comes to things like Bitcoin, uh, things like Coinbase, and some of them, are, you know, they're all human beings, but some of them are actually trying to pull for these small companies, and you can see it. But uh, at the low level, but as you move up the chain of the regulators all the way up to the top, uh, there are people inside that say, listen, uh, we're not moving one inch because we don't know what this means from a regulatory standpoint. So they think that they're actually doing the right thing. And then, of course, there's the obvious, well, you know, it seems like the system is working. We don't need well, new companies have, in it. Uh, Brian, you have 50 regulators. One regulator says no to Bitcoin. One says yes. One says yes, but it's only if it's private currency. One says, well, yes, it's only if it's private property. What the hell is the business going to do about it? And I you mean, can't can buy you alcohol so in this state, and you can't, uh, you know, you, I Can understand. you imagine? So but that's how the beauty, are you going to, see, that's how the beauty you going to of bifurcate being your clients? I mean, well, you know, it, it's ridiculous. You know, listen, w w if you take a, a long view of all business and you look at history, that's why history is so much... So important mm -hmm. in the startup culture. If you take a big enough view, uh, you know, and again, VCs will, a lot of them are brilliant individuals, but they themselves don't understand history very well. And they give sort of, you know, anecdotes to history like, well, it's better to uh, say I'm sorry than ask permission. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. because uh, <laughs> it's it, pretty, Yeah, that's pretty high level and vague, but I yeah, often well, hear it. You hear it all the time, right? But when it comes to financial matters, you are going to find somebody that's going to be made an, uh, an example of. And everybody thinks it's going to be the other guy. Uh, and so I, I would never, ever recommend somebody to go around and, and come into this um, world of uh, money transmitting, even indirectly, mm -hmm. and, and be the one that looks uh, – that's going to be caught without a seat. Uh, when uh, when the music uh, is turned off, if you will, uh, it's going to be regulated. Uh, it's going to be probably regulated at a um, federal government level. Uh, it's going to come in the next year or two, uh, and it will supersede state regulation when it comes to things like Bitcoin. The money transmitter laws, why they're not regulated centrally by the federal government is because of the state's rights. Um, but there is something called the interstate commerce uh, laws. And these are areas where the federal government could really use their domain to control uh, mm -hmm. how not only will Bitcoin move, but it could very well be used in a way to control how money transmitters are going to operate. It's going to take political will. It's going to take another election. It's not going to happen until the next election. Uh, I think Bitcoin is going to be on the agenda. I think you'll hear 
in in uh, in our lives, you're going to hear presidential candidates talk about Bitcoin publicly, and uh, and possibly use it as part of their foundation to get elected. And um, I think both parties, or independent parties, most definitely, are going to say favorable things, and uh, but they're going to wrap it in the in the guise of of, uh, of consumer protection always. So, so, would you agree that the pendulum is swinging in the direction of <clears throat> uh, more more liberal, more yeah. Open. So the next the next uh, bill we see get passed is going to say uh, money transmitter license in some capa- some capacity becomes easier, cheaper, faster to get. Or okay. well, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to disagree with Brian. I, I don't think so. The U.S. is going to see any central license for a money transfer in the next five years. Well, I'm not going to call it a central money transmitter license. What I'm going to say is here's the problem: California is clearly on a, a, a legislative uh, line where they're going to rec- recognize uh, Bitcoin as a currency. There's no doubt that's going to happen. Not legal tender. Big difference. I, I don't use the word fiat. It's irrelevant here. Uh, legal tender, but it will be a currency. Um, once one state in the United States regulates it as a currency, every other state has to recognize that it is regulated in that manner. Therefore, they cannot deregulate it in their state. And this is, again, coming down to the interstate commerce laws. Again, maybe some lawyers know a little bit about this, but even the lawyers that are doing money transmitter licenses, when I bring up interstate commerce laws, they look confused. Well, how does that apply? Well, that's the groundwork of how things get done in, in, from a state to state level. Now, again, that gives states rights, but also gives the federal government rights to enforce equality of the movement of goods and services around the country and to distill something down that's hundreds of volumes down to something very simple in a uh, you know in, in a show like this it basically says that you cannot make something that is considered legal in one state fully illegal in your state for all intent and purposes. That's why when we start seeing these different laws changing and it cre- uh, creates a sort of imbalance, ultimately interstate commerce laws will take over. Now, if the federal government de- declares something illegal, yet a state is calling it legal and the government still, federal government still wants it to be legal, they may not interpret it as such. Now, when it comes to mm. Bitcoin, um, you're going to see a merging of ideas. Obviously, for a lot of tax purposes, the IRS had to make a choice on how they declared Bitcoin. Uh, and by not declaring it a currency, they actually did a lot of people more favors than they realize. Uh, and uh, it is an evolving thing. Even the IRS commissioner that wrote the law clearly said, I did not intend to make this law make Bitcoin become less useful. That's not our intent. And it's an evolving situation. But tax season was approaching. People had Bitcoin profits to report and they had to make a decision. And that's what a lot of people who've gotten crazed about this started saying, oh, it's a conspiracy. You you just don't have enough time. And we're giving too much credit to people who, you know, their job is to regulate, but their job isn't to follow the cutting, bleeding edge of technology and and be right there with us mentally. Now, they're fielding advice. Some of the best Bitcoin... uh, uh, people I know are literally in Washington right now speaking with the IRS to try to resolve uh, potential conflicts. But on top of that, there's legislation that is being that will be presented and it will probably be presidential assertions uh, very soon that will try to guide this in a, in, in a manner. Now, what that means is when businesses are going to start developing Bitcoin ideas, I don't think the highest echelons of government want to see this be uh, the creativity being limited. If we did want to see, if they did want to see the creativity limited, they would have done something quite a long time ago. Literally, they could have done a lot of things to, to, to uh, almost make it impossible. State of New York, state of California are jockeying to be ground zero for Bitcoin creativity. Uh, you know, who who wins at this? I don't know. They're approaching it from different. Uh, uh, mindsets and in, in New York, they really want to create exchanges. This week, this last couple of days, the Bloom the Bloomberg terminal that sits on an every financial professional's desk I've ever known now is actively tracking 24 hours a day the movement of Bitcoin. 
you know, the, 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 the trade. So, so at least they're on the right side. It seems, you know, it, I at think least, everybody's you know, on the right the, side. The, the, yeah. No, but, but, but holding back, you have to look at it from a slightly different viewpoint, which is all the exchanges that, are, that have volume and liquidity are outside the U.S. And the reason they're outside <laughs> That's the true. U.S. Is, is because, well, guess what? You can't get a license for all 50 states for Bitcoin exchange right now. It's just not possible right now in May 2013, 2014, you know, Half and of the states are just sitting on the fence. And so, so that's why I think you're going to see more guidance coming from uh, very high up in, in the federal government to try to normalize these laws. I, I, the effect may not help, you know, a specific state in their money transmitter uh, minutia that they make people go through. But some innovation in financial services will be cut open uh, and more free. Uh, with uh, federal guidance. Now, how that winds up manifesting, I don't think anybody knows. All I know is the people I've talked to who are pretty much cl- very, very close to the subject, uh, they want to see that happen. And it it it's, it's, has nothing to do with, you know, the rebellion against banks and the the anarchy of Bitcoin and all that. It has to do with supporting innovation. So, and, and that's why it's refreshing to me. I mean, to hear regulators say, listen, I want to I don't want to see this innovation go away. We we see more things coming out of this than just Bitcoin as a currency. It's good they, it's good they have some some uh, <laughs> little foresight. Faisal, yeah. I, I know you know the the Coinex uh, uh, team. What what are they going to do? I mean, are they they seem to be uniquely positioned to obtain fifty money transfer well, licenses. I honestly, I honestly can't I can't speak for them because I'm under an NDA right now. Uh, but you can certainly have uh, Megan Burton come on your show. Uh, yeah, we'll have to. We'll have to do Megan that. Megan is brilliant. I think uh, she yeah. would give but, us but, a lot but, of insight. You know, c- coming back to the uh, the money transfer, I mean, right now it's a very unfair game for the small players. The guys who uh, are small are forced to go to certain money transmitter companies that will somehow extend the umbrella coverage of as an agent of their license to these startups and then charge a pretty penny for it. If you have a money transmitter license today, for example, you just get it in the, I don't know, state of Georgia or Florida, what have you, and you want to open a bank account, it is next to impossible opening a bank account with a money transmitter license Absolutely. in the U.S. today. I mean, this is the state that we are in right now. Unless you're not a huge, huge company with a lot of money behind you, no one wants to do business. No banking institution will open an account for you. Faisal, Can you imagine? What if, what, Faisal, what if you walked into the bank? There are What if you walked into the bank and said, I'm, I'm a money transmitter and I'm doing Bitcoin? What, what do you think? <laughs> what do you oh, think God. That's? I, I, you'll be shown all the exits. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you one thing. There are, uh, you know, it, it's now come down to a point where if you have a money transmitter license, it, it, there are forums that are people are literally begging. Can you please tell me the name of a bank that will open a bank account with me because I have a money transmitter license? No you want to hear something to. interesting? The, sure. the payday loan companies, the ones that are mm-hmm. you know littering around a lot of the bigger cities around the country, they already have money transmitter licenses by virtue of what they're doing, right? And I have seen these guys prosper in the last couple of months, actually that last two years, but mostly in the last year, uh, by Bitcoin entrepreneurs approaching them and saying, I want to essentially rent your money transmitter license. Uh, there might maybe some crackdown on this, but these guys are profiting immensely. Not only are they profiting you know, on, the, on the poor I know souls, from, you know, from on my, this side of it too. From my consultancy, I know about, I think at least 10, 12 companies that are just that have a valid business, uh, except now they want to do it across state lines, and they've applied for money transmitter licenses. Yeah, you know most of the states are not giving it. Those that are, uh, you know, just just I mean, the weight is so much; it's not even funny. And then the biggest issue is, well, we need to open a bank account. We need to, you know, leverage our bank accounts, or or in some cases, even the existing banker has come and said, "Guess what? I'm gonna have to close your account down." Yeah, because of that money trans, and, and and it's purely fud, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, that is causing this thing. But if you were a Sand Hill Road back VC that was funding your company, guess what? Hundreds of banks willing to work with you. And let's start with the Silicon, you know, Valley Bank, what have you. 
but for the small guys it's 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 absolutely an unfair advantage unfair playing field on uh, it's a non level playing field and you know they are frustrated because of this hmm and and Faisal, how does it how does it pour, uh, sort of play out in the outside us walls i mean so far so you, we've talked about I mean, mostly okay, forget, just forget crossing the pond i mean let's just go up north canada mm-hmm. one license it's not even a license per se it's a registration voila you're willing to do you're ready to do business in less than if i have the number correctly two weeks wow How about mexico uh not sure about mexico but uk is about a two three month process ireland eu and if you get a uk license money transmitter license you automatically can qualify for an eu license as well boy so is there any other more difficult place that you know of personally than the united states to do this japan yeah very hard very hard to get a license over there in china home of mount gox <laughs> how come mm-hmm. china. Why is it china. china too china too china and japan are too what, what about north korea Pakistan, india <laughs> uh, uh, india is a very close loop uh, the, so money transmitters are, there are not many businesses in pakistan india bangladesh even the gcc for that matter which is the gulf cooperation countries where you have money transmitter license as a as a defined term for businesses you have a money transmitter licenses for remittance companies which is you know moving money across the border uh but sadly you don't have money transmitter licenses for for people who want to become payment service providers or a business that wants to somehow get you know some of little part of the action of the money movement there isn't uh, any. Uh, Pakistan, for example, is undergoing a review right now. It's going to be called the Designated Payment Institute or the Designated Payment Network License. Uh, but it's it's very costly. It's two million dollars to get wow. it. Wow! And in India obviously has an, an entrenched, uh, you know, money transmitter uh, environment with the uh, postal system. I mean, that's very large. Uh, in fact, that's pretty much a it bank is, for a lot of is, people. It is. It is. It is, but if you're talking digital payments or mobile payments or web payments, uh, you can—I mean—you can become a processor or an aggregator uh, by virtue of you know one down from a bank from the acquiring bank. But if you want to come into the business of you know where you would traditionally classify yourself as a money transmitter, they just don't offer it. In fact, getting a remittance license in India is such a big deal it is such a big deal not just in india in pakistan even even in bangladesh it's very very highly regulated and to the best of my knowledge applications are closed they're not even accepting applications okay so here's a perfect time to break this out because hundreds of people ask me this all the time even people with great financial service knowledge clearly define money transmitter and remittances and where they converge and where they diverge so remittance is, <clears throat> excuse me, comes under money transmitter. Remittance is a feature or a function you would do once you have a money transmitter license. A money transmitter is someone who is transmitting money from party A to party B and taking a transaction charge or a revenue charge from it. So if you were to do hotel booking or escrows or uh, uh, classifieds or, or, or car bookings or what have you or P2P uh, you know wallets etc or even money transfers that all comes under the money transmitter license and to be and to get a money transmitter license you would be classified as a money service business with that state you would have to register as a money service business and then you apply for a money transmitter license now, okay, so then there is a subsection of regulation and law around the world, I'm sure, uh, for people that are involved in remittances, right? Uh, so that's a subsection of so, more regulation? Um, it is, but it depends on country to country. So, for example, if you have, let's say, BDO. BDO is a bank in the Philippines. It's called Bank de Oro. It's a pretty big bank, and they want to get money from the U.S. market, from the U.S. Des- from the, you know, Filipino uh, diaspora that's in the U.S. who want to send money back home to the Philippines. If they are going to work with the U.S. partner, and let's assume they have a a legal partner in the U.S. that has all the 50 money transmitter licenses to work with, FinCEN, which is the federal uh, body for for crime enforcement network uh, uh, by uh, the the federal financial crime enforcement network body, 
would require that BDO, which is outside the U.S., register with them. Even though they are not in the U.S., even though they are not present in the U.S., but because you're soliciting business, either soliciting or, or you know, terminating business in the U.S., you need to register with FinCEN. Now, that's a pretty simple registration. It's not, it's not that complicated, but it's easy to get. Now, if you were to, uh, if that bank in Philippines wants to, if it doesn't have a partner in the U.S. and then it wants to work, then they'll need to obtain the money transfer licenses. And for each so, license, you know, you have to have a compliance officer, you have to do the bonding, you have to be physically present. There's just so much that goes around in that. So that Filipino bank, by the virtue of the fact that they're a bank in the United States, I'm sure they have to have an office in the United States, that doesn't give them a realm to be able to be a money transmitter in and of itself because they are a bank? Well, uh, in case of BDO, they do not have an office in the U.S. Oh, okay. Uh, they're, they're, a bank, they're a bank outside. Uh, but they need they don't need a money transmitter license. The license would be required by the party in the U.S. that would be onboarding the uh, transaction. I got them. it. I got it. But 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 federal law says that, that BDO needs to register with FinCEN be it an individual or a company that's outside. If you're doing money transmission business with the U.S., you need to register with FinCEN. Hmm. Now, how about other parts of the world where we have the money transmitter and then we have remittances under the same umbrella? It, it, the same topography is this? So, yeah. So let's let's talk Pakistan. So if, a, if Zoom.com, for example, wants to send money to Pakistan, now, Zoom is an online business based out of California, has the money transmission licenses. They need to send money to Pakistan. So they are going to somehow work with a bank in Pakistan and terminate the, those remittances, that, you know, right? So the Pakistan government says, well, that's fine. The bank in Pakistan is responsible for making sure that a tie-up agreement is presented. And a tie-up agreement means that who is your tie-up in the U.S.? Well, it's Zoom. Well, give us all the documentation for Zoom. We will audit them. Only once we give you an okay will they be licensed to send money into our country. Wow. 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 So so is, happens, is, is, and, and, and this happens all over the world everywhere. And is everyone playing by these rules? I mean, are these regulations that, that are sort of so, uh, touch I mean, and go? Or? So, so, so we, we touched about, you know, uh, AML a couple of shows back. Um, so the rules differ and vary. But just to give you an idea, if the, if the legal white economy of money transmission for remittances uh, is $550 billion, then the illegal market is about 80% of that. So wow. clearly the rules are not being followed, right? They're optional. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Boy, that is just crazy. So, so money where, where do you see this going in your part of the world? I mean, when it comes to um, we, we talk about this all the time about the entrenched players and uh, and the opportunities for innovation, startups, things like that. Um, do you see that there is even some desire to to try to make it easier for entrepreneurs? Uh, would you want to oh. get away with? Uh, I'll, I won't ask permission. I'll just uh, say I'm sorry. Scenarios in in Pakistan, for example, or will you wind but, up oh, uh, 25 you. years in life? You know? Well, over here, so the banking, you know, contrary to popular belief, the banking is pretty rigid. So if you're going to try to launch something, you would need some sort of an inroad with the bank to, you know, work with the deposits or what have you, have access to an API, etc. Uh, the, the central bank says, listen, we can make the license cheaper, but then there'll be hundreds and hundreds of people applying for it. And hmm. we, it would become very difficult for us to sort of sift through that. So let's make it expensive. Let, let the big guys come in. Then let those big guys under their license make the smaller guys on board, you know, with them. Eventually, we will see how it goes. We will get the procedures right, you know, the audit right, the processes, etc. Then we will open another category of licenses, which will be more affordable. So, you know, start with the big guys. You know, it's like you make a country. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to have 10 big banks or do you want to have 2,000 small banks? At the end of the wow. day, the back office the back office has to look at the paperwork. So let's, well, just, let's just do the ten big banks. Hmm. You know, 
That's less chance of a default. Let, that's less chance of a default over there. But outside of banks, I mean, don't you look at it and say, like, the screaming thing to me here is that if we make it difficult for uh, companies to obtain these licenses, then there's going to be less innovation, right? Like Venmo and Face Cash and, and so 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 like, in outside the U.S., uh, the way forward is that you go partner up with the bank. You say, listen. The brand will be powered by your name. So you will have a face cash or a square, uh, okay. whatever it is. And then it'll say powered by Barclays or powered by UBL, powered by whatever the bank's name is. So the ownership and onus of that transaction lies with the bank who is already licensed. You just happen to have a separate agreement with the bank on your revenue share. Hmm. So it's not like you're stif- it's not like you're stifling growth over there. Mm-hmm. You have the arrangement. It's just not hundred percent yours. And these are these are not necessarily payment companies. I mean, before you mentioned the hotel, uh, the you know the Uber esque uh, driving company that takes a transaction fee. Is is that is that right? I mean, they're not. They're not, they shouldn't be thinking about money transmitter licenses. Well, I mean, if, so even with Uber, so if their processor is not providing them coverage. And they need to get a money transfer license. Hmm. Yeah, you know, this is where uh, I think Aaron uh, Greenspan's lawsuit starts sort of splitting hairs. And I think his attorney advised him and maybe he himself were to try to see where the fence line is in wrapping up payments into services. And, um, you know, it's going to be interesting because as you start moving money, see, Uber has got two sides to this. They're paying drivers, right? And they're also taking money from consumers. So they are, in fact, in a way, transmitting money. I mean, again, it's a, it's a bit of a novel uh, argument. Not, not only that, they are also keeping the money until, and, and I'm sure the driver doesn't get paid immediately. There's That's a payout right. mechanism, you know? So yeah. they're holding on to that money. So if their processing bank, as well as their processing partner, is not providing them coverage under the money transmitter license or under the federal charter of the bank, then they need a license. Well, let's look at Dwala, and this is the one that really, really uh, is the thorn in the foot of uh, Aaron, from what I can understand. Dwala is um, operating in all 50 states. They clearly are transmitting money, yet they do not really have a single money transmitter license outside the state uh, that they uh, are located in. And the, re- the way they get around this is the significant owner of the company or the holding company of Douala is a savings and loan type of uh, local Credit community union, bank. Yeah. Credit union, yeah. yeah. And uh, they're organizing this sort of a savings and loan umbrella in that state. Um, and this is an interesting thing because, uh, it, again, it's a novel way to approach this uh, around uh, all these uh, money transmitter laws. And I would not be surprised to see other companies do the same thing, even if they already have a money transmitter license. Recently, I somebody... Think- go ahead. I think one of the things you'll see very soon emerge because of all this uh, experience that people are going through is you will see some sort of an associated network that will come across, you know, like the Money Transmitter Association of America. Sure. And all, you know, one guy will say, I have, well, I have a license in California, well, I have a Texas, and I have in Utah, I have a, you know, I don't know, uh, in Nebraska, what have you. And they'll all come to a singular platform. And then the platform itself will somehow be able to connect with all these small players who want a piece of the action or want to get the coverage of the license. But there'll be a there'll be a fee to pay, a flat fee, or what yeah. have you. But I think that that the, sort of uh, association will come into play. The question is what it will really look like. I mean, the last successful uh, payment card issued in the United States, and I was recently asked this on Quora, uh, was the, the Discover card. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand how this card got into existence. I mean, Sears owned uh, the, the Dean Witter company that put it together. And their dream was to be a bank, uh, but to offer banking services. And um, the uh, idea was also to do investments, money transmitter, uh, personal person payments. Back in 1980s, uh, people weren't even thinking of that. But, you know, people at Discover were very innovative. They, they saw that coming. They ultimately had to buy the Greenwood Trust Company. Uh, and the reason they did that is the banks went after Discover aggressively and uh, essentially throwing money transmitter laws at them, all sorts of things. See, they were able to operate the, the Sears card uh, without having the money transmitter license for a lot of different reasons, the Sears charge card uh, and, and credit card. 
But later on, when they tried to make themselves into a, a, a competing system against the banks at that time, there were uh, organizations and not publicly traded companies, Visa and MasterCard, the banks controlled them more directly. They went after them with full fire. Fast forward, uh, what they essentially created was the first um, challenge, very much like Diwala did, uh, and hopefully will do, uh, the first, first challenge to uh, Visa and MasterCard. Uh, you know, and here we are today. Um, they are accepted at 99% of Visa and MasterCard locations. It's just on the cardholder side, they're not as... Uh, as aggressive as they as they once were, and uh, so I think there are topographies one can use. That was a private company, although very large, uh, very challenged uh, to get into the business, but in, in fact created uh, a system. And now one of the transitional things before they sold to uh, Morgan Stanley uh, was, uh, and Dean Witter was still an entity that people understood as an investment company, was that they were starting to move money. And this is my connection, the big money transmitter uh, connection here. They're starting to move money to uh, uh, nationals uh, from around uh, the, the country. And they were giving 2% cash back on the money movement. This was pretty amazing uh, at the time. Wow. So uh, amazing, uh, amazing uh, bit of history, I think. All right, guys. I mean, we're, we're kind of at that time. This has been incredibly informative, Faisal. I'm blown away yes, always Faisal. by how much knowledge you have <laughs> about this subject. Um, One man holding all that information. <laughs> yeah, no, I see why you're so popular. Yeah. All right, guys. Until next time. Thank you very much. Thank Talk you, next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.